Today we're going to talk about the man with thousands of demons. And Jesus performs an exorcism, an exorcism on this man to cast these demons out. This reveals some interesting things to us about Jesus' identity, like about who Christ is. And that's a theme in Mark. I'm trying to really focus on that as we go through Mark. It's about who is, G- who is Jesus, who is this person. Um, it also reveals that there's really hope for everyone because if Jesus could heal this guy, if he could fix his broken life, then there's hope for you. Uh, and that, that's heartwarming, good stuff right there. I've already given you the application. Your Bible study's done. You're, you can just quit now. Oh, no, you care about the interpretation too. Okay, we'll keep going then. Um, also, it gives us some interesting insights into demonology. So I'm not going to try and pretend like I know everything about demonology, but rather we're going to gather a few insights from this passage that I think are very interesting. We'll talk about some of that stuff and probably we'll have an interesting Q&A uh, afterwards, I imagine. Um, there's one other thing we'll do as we're in this passage, Mark chapter 5, uh, this demoniac, the guy with thousands of demons. We're also going to deal with a apologetic issue, and that is um, the location of where this thing happened. Mark says it happened in a place, well, in the country of the Gerasenes. And the skeptic will sometimes say, Mark is just wrong here because Gerasa is over 30 miles away from the Sea of Galilee, which means they're saying Jesus traveled across the sea, came out of the boat, and then he's suddenly 30 miles away. He cast the demons out of the sky, and then these pigs run down into the Sea of Galilee. So then they insert a joke about pigs flying, like how did they get there so fast? Um, and that sort of thing. Well, we're going to deal with this because the basic accusations, Mark doesn't even know the geography of the area. I'm going to return to that at the end of the service. We'll, we'll, we'll do the whole study through Mark 5, then we'll come back to that um, apologetic issue, and I'll offer solutions to this supposed problem in the text. So here we are, Mark chapter 5. We're just going to read straight through these 20 verses, verse 1 through 20. Get the story, put it in our minds. You're gathering questions. You're getting, you know, you're reading this thoughtfully now to try to figure out what questions you have about the passage, what insights you might gain, and just to load the story so we can discuss it in more detail. Here we are, Mark 5, verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an, with an unclean spirit met him, and he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouted with a loud voice. He said, what business do you have, do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what had happened, or what, what, what it was that had happened. They came to see Jesus. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him. But he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Okay, I'm going to sort of separate the way we're going to do this study. Sometimes I approach a passage of scripture and I just usually go verse by verse right through it. I'm going to separate this a little bit more topically. We're going to approach those verses in a more topical fashion. So we're going to start with this. Let's talk about the man's possession. Just details about his possession that we get from the passage. Then we'll deal with the behavior of the man, like diagnosing what was wrong with him, that kind of thing. We're going to kind of go through topics like that. So first about his possession. Um, He's possessed. Okay, this much is obvious from the text. Like he's possessed. 
It's interesting that there's interchangeable terms used to describe what possesses the man. The terms are unclean spirit and demon. These are interchangeable terms. They, they're the same thing. An unclean spirit and a demon are the same thing in the text. There's no difference between these two things. What exactly is a demon or an unclean spirit, though? And there's a bit of a debate on this. I'm not going to get into it in detail tonight, um, but there's basically two camps that I'm, that I'm aware of. One camp would say that demons are just basically fallen angels. They're some of the host of heaven that have sided with Satan and, and turned from God. And they're submitted to him and they're part of his, his kingdom, so to speak. Um, others would say, no, they're, it ties back to Genesis chapter 5 and we have the story in 6 and we have the story of the Nephilim in Genesis 6. And these Nephilim are ultimately somehow connected to these demons and they, they sort of get there through Jewish intertestamental sources, not through a study ultimately of Genesis. It's not really, there's nothing in the text of the Bible that I see that connects the demons to these guys, but this is where some people go and they kind of quote rabbis, extra biblical sources to try to kind of make that connection. In this case, they would see demons as being a very peculiar kind of thing, like they have to possess people or things or else they'll, they'll die. They're, they're like somehow connected to these Nephilim and all this kind of thing. And to me, it seems a little bit vague and a little bit stretching, to be honest. Um, so I, I, I lean towards thinking they're just fallen angels. I think that's kind of the standard view. Um, and there could be a huge variety of fallen angels. It's not like angels are just one kind of thing. They, they may not be in the sense like humans where it's, we're all relatively the same. I'll have to save the questions for the end. But, um, but we, we may have, who knows what kind of variety. When you actually read about angelic beings in scripture, they're sometimes very different than each other and very unique. And so there's just an awful lot we don't know about these things. And I'm willing to say I don't know about that stuff. Some people try to nail down every little thing about demons or angels, and I feel like they're just going beyond what we know in the text of Scripture, oftentimes. So there's a lot we don't know. Um, we know one thing Jesus mentions in, um, let's see, the passage is Matthew 12, 45, that there are some that are worse than others. Some of these things are worse than others. And we'll, come, we'll actually quote that passage later. So there's, there's differences between them. But let's, let's look now at the behavior of the man. So he's, he's possessed by demons, which I think are likely just fallen angels who've sided with, um, with Satan. And um, there could be a wide variety of these, whatever these beings are, in detail. Spirit beings, obviously. The behavior of the man, this is in verses 2 through 7. Here's, let's piece together what he's doing, what's going on with this guy, so we can get like a diagnosis of what his life is like. It says that he dwells among the tombs. He dwells among the tombs. Like this is not where anybody wants to hang out. Nobody wants to live here. He lives here because he's been ostracized from society. So if you think about the man's life, he has been, he doesn't fit in society. He's either chased out of town or he's driven himself out because of his behavior. He's outside society. This is a miserable place to live. The scripture says actually that he was naked. The guy was just unclothed. He was just going around with no clothes on. And we get a hint of this in Mark, but it's more clear in Luke 8.27. Luke 8.27 says, and when, he'd come out, uh, and when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. So he's like dehumanized at this point. I mean, you walk around with no clothing on and living in the tombs, like you're in a sorry state. This is a miserable, miserable place to be. And there's plenty of other people who are in this kind of situation, I think, around the world. In um, Mark 5.15, after Jesus heals the man, after Jesus casts these demons out, it says that he was clothed and in his right mind. And that may be where Mark is actually hinting at the same thing Luke says explicitly, that the guy was unclothed before the exorcism and then was clothed after. Because they see him and he's clothed and in his right Why would you mention, oh, and he had clothes, <laughs> except because he didn't before. So this is like maybe an undesigned coincidence between Mark and Luke on this, uh, on this topic. Oops, sorry, my microphone's noisy here. So here we are, um, verse 5. It describes him more. It says, constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. So he's screaming. And this is, to me, it, it almost breaks my heart when I think about this, this real person. He's just screaming. He's just screaming. This is his life. He's just yelling and screaming among the tombs, constantly, night and day. It says he was wandering about, effectively. He's, he's in the mountains, he's in the tombs. He just has nothing to do with his life. He just wanders about with, his, with his all sorts of crazy stuff going on in his mind. 
miserable, miserable guy. It says he's gashing himself with stones. That is, you might say this is like cutting. Modern day, you know, cutting is like a thing. Um, whereas I think hardly anybody did it uh, years ago. It seems like it's a thing, almost as though the more we talk about it, the more kids go, wait, what's that? I'll try that. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I've talked to kids who said that they only tried it because they heard 20 people talking about it. Um, at any rate, I wonder if this whole idea of cutting has some sort of demonic agenda pushing behind it. This whole idea of self-harm. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. His agenda, his goal is to wreck and mess up lives. And getting a person to harm themselves, to just deliberately hurting yourself, is like a huge win for Satan. And so this guy, he's demonized to this point where he's gashing himself with stones. I, I don't know how much of cutting is satanic, di di directly or indirectly, or any of that kind of stuff, but I, it seems connected. In fact, the only other example in scripture I know of cutting is the prophets of Baal when Elijah challenges them on Mount Carmel. And in order to get their gods, their fake God's attention to try to get him to do something to prove he exists, they cut themselves. And they keep cutting themselves and cutting themselves. Now this was, however, different than modern day cutting, that kind of issue, this sort of self-harm to like make myself feel better about myself. It's just, it's the most weird thing. Um, and I, I must admit, I don't understand it except that I know what it's like to be tempted to hurt yourself, but I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense, and I don't know that if it really makes sense for anybody. So it may just be a, just a sick thing that Satan's pushing on people. I don't know. As we read on in verses 3 through 4, it says, And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. So he seems to have either supernatural strength, or um, the pushing of adrenaline to the point where he doesn't care what happens to himself. And we get this with other people. Some people, when they're in a state of insanity or they're hopped up, hyped up on PCP, they, they can do stuff that you didn't know human, a human could even do that because there's just no limit to how much of their... We have a lot of strength reserves we don't use. Your body limits how much your muscles will actually be able to exert unless you have incredible amounts of adrenaline pumping and then your body may give in. And this is how we see like a woman pick up a car to get it off her kid or something like that. Um, I remember um, one time we were up in Utah doing a, a mission trip and we were on the beach and there was this little girl and she was about a football field away or so and she was swimming in the water and she was drowning and her family didn't notice um, that she was drowning but we did, some in our group did and I'm a pretty fast swimmer so when they hollered out like that girl's drowning I jumped to the water and I've never swam so fast in my life. I mean I could feel myself on top of the water and Got there in like 0 0.02 seconds. I don't know, it wasn't that. But got there very quickly, got the girl and brought her back to the shore. And, um, and then on the way back, walking on the beach back to my group, I just, I just collapsed. Because it had just been all pure adrenaline rush to get me going that, that hardcore. And then my body was like, okay, you're done now. And I, just had, I was like, ah, I just have to sit here for a while. And there's, there's something in our human reserves. And it seems to me that um, either hyped up on drugs or or just demonic possession can just put someone in such a state that they're either exerting supernatural strength that's coming from demonic sources or abnormal human like determination and even self-destructive use of your own muscles because of the influence those things are having on you. Now we encounter demon possessed, stories of demon possession in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, in particular in the Gospels. Never like this, though, right? I mean, it's like, okay, this guy's got a demon. He, you know, Jesus cast the demon out into story. Or there's a kid who has fits, and for some reason these fits, they're not just like an epileptic fit, but rather these fits always bring him to harm. It always happens at the worst moment. It always, he falls into the fire. He doesn't just fall randomly, right? It's always like harm to hurt or kill him. It, you know, this is like a fit attack that goes on. We have that kind of thing. But this guy's like way next level. This guy gashing himself with stones, naked, screaming out in the tombs, you know, chains. The, all this stuff is like way next level. So the question I have in, as I read this is, why is it so extreme? Why is this, whatever he's suffering, why is it so extreme? And I think the answer is, well, it's verse 9. It's in Hollywood's, one of Hollywood's favorite verses. Right? My name is Legion, for we are many. I swear, I think that there are Hollywood script writers who have a set of Bible verses just to take out of context for their horror movies. 
I think that they, they, they have this stuff. It's like I've never seen them use them in context, but they seem to take them just to try to borrow from the respectability of scripture to try to add a realism feel to their horror stories or whatever they're telling. And um, I, I do find it offensive every single time, <laughs> as do many Christians. Um, it's so sad that they would be going to the word of God to amplify their artificial fear factor they're creating with their film, but not for the hope there is in Christ and for the real reason that we have to go to the scripture. It's just a sad thing. But he says, my name is Legion for we are many. A Roman legion would have been probably 6,000 soldiers at the time. Um, maybe as low as four or normally probably closer to six. Um, how many exactly demons were in this guy? I mean, this is why it was so extreme. There's a massive number of evil spirits inhabiting this man. That's why his behavior is insane. It's totally extreme. It's way beyond anything else we read. Well, we also know that when Jesus exercises kicks these demons out, they go into this herd of swine. The herd of swine goes and runs off the hill, but how many were there? 2,000. There were 2,000. Does this mean, oh, well, there's, there were 2,000 demons? Well, I don't know. There's nothing, no rule that says there's, there was exactly the same number of demons as there were swine. The best thing we have is them saying, we're, our name is Legion, for we are many. Of course, who knows how honest they were being. <laughs> the point is thousands. I mean, it, there must have been a very large number um, for this to be the case. Could have been... Um, could have been maybe as much as 6,000. Now, why would I say that a large number of demons made his life worse than a single demon? Well, it seems to make sense. <laughs> I mean, it seems to be. I don't know, but if you have, let's say that some thug comes to beat you up, and then later on, 20 thugs come to beat you up, it's worse, right? Like, I mean, it's just more numbers makes it worse. But there's another actual text of scripture where Jesus teaches on this topic. And he seems to imply that for those who have multiple demons possessing them, it's worse. And it's in uh, Matthew 12. So I'll read Matthew 12 verses 43 through 45. And this is what Jesus says. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, which the house is the man. This, this is a story is the unclean spirit kicked out of the man. I'll go back to the house. So the house, the person's like a place to be and a place to occupy. Um, so he goes, I will return to the house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put in order, an empty, organized home. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And here we get more wicked, so there's some that are worse than others. And they go and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Jesus was coming, he was casting out demons all over the place, and he's like, yes, but you're not receiving me. I'm cleaning your house, but you're not receiving me. And when this demon comes back and finds that you're, you're, you're open for business, you're not occupied by me, the one who had the strength to kick him out, I'm not present. It's going to make, you're going to be worse, not better. That's why the last state is worse than the first state, because it was more demons who were more evil coming and messing with this guy. The interesting point I find here is this, the, uh, the connection that the house is unoccupied. Um, and I think the application to us from that passage is that there's a danger in temporary blessing from Christ. And many of us who come and we're like, oh God, you really helped me in that hard time. You really, you really saved me from that tough situation. But they didn't enter into a relationship with Christ. Into a, my life belongs to Jesus Christ. Like this just doesn't, isn't a reality for them. And that their life may end up actually worse in the long run because I received a temporary blessing showing God's goodness, showing God's love, but didn't respond with this allegiance to God. I want the presence of Christ in my life. Um, this is also one of the reasons why I don't think personally, I don't believe that a Christian can be possessed because the very problem is after the demon was cast out, he came and the house was unoccupied. Yet, yet we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us. Right? He makes our, his home with us. So it's occupied. And so while I do think we as Christians can suffer genuine demonic attack, I think demonic possession seems impossible because of the occupation of the Holy Spirit inside of a believer. And I've had people say that if they think that that's incorrect, it seems like good theology to me. So I hold that at least for my understanding. Um, so this brings up a bunch of questions. Um, I've, earlier we talked about the issue of is all medical illness considered demonic in nature? And I argue that it's not and that the text of Mark differentiates it. Sometimes it's just sickness, sometimes it's demonic and it's not, it's not, there's no pat answer here. I think the next question is, is all insanity or mental illness 
demonic. Whenever someone acts crazy, do we just go, demon? And I think this is a big mistake, as most of us, I think, are already on that page, right? To say, yeah, that's a big mistake to just say that one cause is the only cause. That's a big, big mistake. And it can even do the most harm to the person who's struggling with mental problems, who has no demonic anything going on, but now they think they do because people maybe are telling them they do or they misunderstand this and talk about it. Now, if you're already struggling with mental stuff and then you think it's demonic when it's not, that is not going to help. This is going to make things a lot worse for you, I think. Um, so I would say the Bible doesn't say that. Um, I would say a few things that we can, we can observe, right, is that during Jesus' time, specifically the Gospels, there's a serious increase in demonic activity. This seems to be the case. Um, Jesus is casting out demons like that he's, that he's encountering them in a lot of places, and it's almost like because of the presence of Jesus is coming at, at a dark, dark, dark time spiritually for the people of Israel. There's just a lot going on there. And Jesus comes to cast them out. But we don't see this in the Old Testament. We don't see this demonic possession all the time. And we don't see it in the book of Acts. And we don't read about it in the epistles. What I'm saying is, even in a, in a biblical perspective, the stuff that happened when Jesus was walking the earth was way magnified during those three years. This isn't to say it doesn't happen, but I'm saying that we shouldn't think however often it happened to Jesus, that's how often it happens everywhere all the time. I'm thinking that this is, this is not the lesson we get from the story of Jesus. It may have been abnormal. It may have been the exception, not the rule. Even the book of Acts, it's, it's way more rare, way more rare than, uh, than when we read about in Jesus in the Gospels. Um, I would say that, you know, biblically some physical illness is demonic and some is not, and I think the same can be true of mental illness. I think that mental illness can be caused by a whole variety of factors that I don't even pretend to understand them all. And it, as Christians, just because I know Jesus doesn't mean I know everything about what goes on inside everybody's head and hearts, people I've never met. I can diagnose everything that's going on there. Obviously not. So I'm open to who knows what it could be. And I would say personally, and maybe you'd agree, experientially, demonic possession is a fairly rare thing, actually. Now in some circles, it seems like it's more common because they're involved in demonic things. But I would say in my experience, this has been a fairly rare thing. Um, whereas some people, like, everything's demonic. Like, you have a drinking problem, that's the demon of alcohol. But there's all kinds of times in the New Testament where we're counseled on issues and it's never related to demons. Husbands, love your wives. Because you have the demon of unlove towards your wife. You know, it's just, this isn't the go-to, right? The main issue that we deal with in, on a regular basis is the flesh. That's the biggest issue is the flesh. Now we have the fiery darts, the wicked one, that's for sure. But this is not necessarily demonic possession or something like that. So I just want us to have some balance. I'm trying to balance things out because I'm, I'm worried about the, the, the extremes. And the two extremes are, one, um, uh, every, every ailment you can think of, it's demonic. And the other extreme on the other side is, no, no, no. It, we're just basically pure chemicals and there's nothing else going on in our lives. So we can fix everything with medication. And... Um, and, you know, demonic stuff is just, you're making that up. Um, that would be the other extreme. So the question we can ask, tough questions we ask the text, like, would medication have helped the demoniac? If we have modern medication, would that have helped this guy at all? Well, my, my answer, now I'll take this with a grain of salt. I'm just trying to wrestle through modern issues as we reading, are reading through the scripture here. Take this with a grain of salt. But I think that my answer would be maybe. <laughs> but let me explain why I would say maybe, why it's even possible. Um, we don't know when someone is demonically possessed what impact that has on brain chemistry. We don't know. But it may be that, for instance, let's say that the demon caused him to gash. Now, can we treat the gash with, med with medicine? Yes, we all agree we can treat the gash with medicine. It doesn't fix the cause, but we can treat it with medicine. Can we treat the insanity or crazy emotions and stuff? Can we try to solve that with some kind of medication? I don't have a principle, a rule that says, no, you can't. I do think, however, that's not a fix. It would just be like, okay, you gosh, we, we fixed, we did something to help it, but this doesn't fix the actual central problem. So in principle, I could see how meds could have helped. I don't know. They might actually hurt. I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't, uh, I would be hesitant to take medication. I understand and most people would. Um, but I'm not saying in, in principle, we shouldn't just kick it all out because we're like, oh no, if it's spiritual, then you shouldn't have anything physical to help you with it. That's not a good principle for us to have. I think we should 
take a holistic approach. Christians should have a holistic approach. We can look at all these things and embrace them all because we realize we're, we're physical, but we're also spiritual, and we can treat on both sides. So the insight, though, from the man, as we've evaluated like his behavior, is this guy is an extreme example of a ruined life. His life is ruined, ruined, ruined. You wouldn't want to hang out with him for very long, but let's suppose you were a fly on the wall for one day, just following him around, screaming, naked, crazy, gashing him, miserable. He is the extreme example of a ruined life, and Jesus comes all the way to just see the one guy. He fixes him, and he leaves. Jesus came the whole way to find the worst guy in town, to save him. And he's an example for you. Because I can't, I've talked to lots of people who thought, no, I'm just too far gone. And I'm like, well, are you naked, hanging out in the tombs, gashing yourself, and insane, and possessed by thousands of demons? Well, no, I'm probably not that bad. All right, well, there's hope for you. <laughs> and guess what? If you said, yes, I'm that bad, guess what? There's hope for you. That's the point, is that Jesus takes the dregs and the worst and us at our lowest moment. He just needs us to bow our knee and call out to him. He is here to fix us. He's here to, um, to set free the captives, right, for us to take his yoke upon ourselves. And I think that's a beautiful application of this. Okay, so let's talk about the exorcism, the exorcism itself. Um, I always find the word exorcism weird because in my head, even though it really starts as a religious term, I just think of it as a Hollywood term nowadays. Um, full of a bunch of movies that I never watch and I hate even the previews of them. <laughs> and um, they're kooky and weird and it's crazy how many people actually get their beliefs from these movies. Have you talked to these people? Well, I think this is about demons because I saw this movie. I'm like, you realize that's made up by script writers. Yeah, but it said based on a true story. And I'm like, you don't know what that means, do you? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it's okay. So this is like a real, actual biblical exorcism. This is like a real thing that's happening here. And when it happens, we can note some things. Uh, in Luke 8, 31, uh, we have additional information that says, they were imploring him, the demons, not to command them to go away into the abyss. Into the abyss. That word abyss is used. And this abyss is a specific location that's like a holding place for evil spirits. It's a holding place for evil spirits. We read about in Revelation specifically. Um, and he's like, don't, don't cast us into the abyss. And this I find really interesting because it's not the first time where one of them has said this. Are you here to torment us before the time? Remember when they said that to Jesus, the demon? Are you here to torment me before the time? This tells us something. Demons have a view of eschatology, the end times. And their view is kind of narrow. They just know they're doomed. And they know that the appearance of Jesus seems to spell that this doom is, has arrived. But they also know that this thing is supposed to be far off. So they're confused when they see Jesus. Jesus, we know you're going to doom us, but I didn't think it was now. So are you here to torment us before the time? Don't, don't cast us into the abyss. Like we, we see this is coming, but we don't want it to happen yet. So here's what I, I learned from this. They're aware of, of the coming of Christ, at least his second coming, but they don't seem to be familiar with his first coming. And this is by plan. This is the mystery, the great mystery God was not revealing. He written, wrote it down in the text of scripture, but it wasn't explained. It wasn't clear until Christ came and fulfilled it. And then looking back, you see what Jesus came to do. So the demons seem to be aware that they have a temporary place while the drama of rebellion and redemption plays out in the real world. They have a temporary place and then they're going to be doomed, but unaware of what Jesus is doing in his first coming. And that is consistent as we read, um, as we read scripture. I wonder how much Satan and his kingdom were just confused by Jesus going to the cross and they're like, uh, all right, let's do this, you know, and this, it's working, you know, and not realizing that this was their, this was their undoing, which is their undoing. And God, God's using temporary evil for good. And this is what we see throughout the text of scripture. And you've got to drill this into your heart that God uses stuff that seems nonsensical and evil for good. This guy, nobody would have looked at his life and thought good was going to come out of it. Nobody, but some amazing good was about to come out of it. Jesus, in the exorcism, he simply commands, in, in, and they have to leave. They have to just do what he says. That's how this works. This is consistent um, with what we read about in the Bible entirely, about Jesus and exorcism. In fact, from start to finish, they're submitting to him. In verse 6 of Mark 5, they, this man runs and bows down to Jesus, like voluntarily runs and just gets on his knees and bows down to Jesus, and then starts trying to bargain and requ make requests because of the awareness of his authority. 
Now, this is not the kind of way they respond even to angels, right? This is, what does this say about who Jesus is, his incredible authority? But then we get to the question of the, the pigs, the swine. What is up with these pigs? This is a, puzzle, a lot of people puzzle on this, and maybe we can try to get some answers here. In verses 10 through 13, we read this. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on a mountain. The demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. So there's, this is like an area of the Sea of Galilee, by the description of Mark, where there's like a steep bank heading into the water, and they rush down into the water, and they drown there. Um, this brings up one thing that I often hear said about demons, which is the idea that demons must have a, a host. They have to have a host. I think we might be going a little past the text here to say they have to have a host. It, we can say they wanted one, but saying they require one might be a step beyond what we can assume. Um, now, for those who think that demons are some kind of like Nephilim-related Genesis thing, they're inclined to say, ah, they, they have to have a host because it helps them differentiate them from angels. But I don't think that this, uh, fallen angels, I don't think this requires, is required by the passage. It just says they wanted to go into the swine. And we can talk about why in a second. Why? Was it just because they had to or because they preferred to? I don't want to assume too much on it. Um, one thing we note, though, is pigs in Israel. Have you thought about that? There's a swine of pigs in the Holy Land in Israel. Why is this? And some people say that Jesus arranged for these pigs to be killed as judgment. Like the, the whole agenda here is Jesus is like, yeah, go to the pigs because then they're going to die. And it's kind of like judgment. Like, hi, you guys aren't supposed to be raising pigs here anyways. This is like a judgment upon them. And that's possible. Um, I have two problems with that. One, the demons don't like bargain with Jesus. They're not like, hey, let us in the pigs and we'll kill them for you, Jesus. We'll take care of those pigs for you. Like, we don't see this happening at all, right? This seems to be something they do, not something Jesus is like asking them to do. So that's one problem. The other problem is this area of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee looks kind of like the country of Africa if it didn't stick out so much on, on, or on this side from your guys' angle, right? So it's, it's like, imagine like a balloon, like you hold a balloon up. It's kind of like that shape, right? Well, the part of the sea they're on, from your angle, over here, um, this is Gentile area. This is, this is, the area is the Decapolis, which is this Gentile-controlled area. The, the chances are that these pigs are being raised by Greeks, by, by non-Jewish guys, right? They're, they're Gentiles. They're the ones doing this, or Romans, I should say. Um, in fact, the man himself, this demoniac, he's probably not Jewish. So that changes our whole perspective. Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee to come to meet this guy who's non-Jewish, and these pigs are not related to the Jews, actually. So, um, so I, I, I don't think it's, that's the reason for the pigs. Others say that it represents, um, this passage represents the Messiah getting rid of Gentile influence in Israel. He's going to cast off, legion represents like the Roman legion. He's going to cast off, he's going to get rid of those pigs. And I, I think that that doesn't fit the flavor of Mark. This doesn't fit overall. This is almost like an outside opinion being sort of pushed on the text, in my opinion. We, we, we get this sort of thing from some commentators, though. So then I came with this question. Why did these pigs run off a cliff? Like, why did this happen? Why did this happen? And I submit to you a possibility. I could be wrong. It may be that the demons, having entered these pigs, ran them off the cliff to their death just to cause trouble. Because while they, while they can't, you know, they have to submit to Jesus' authority, their whole agenda is to cause problems. That's the whole plan start to finish. Cause trouble, right? You, you've, you've had friends like this. <laughs> their whole agenda in life is just to cause problems. And it may have worked because these pigs represented a ton of money, right? 2,000 pigs, this is a lot of money, a lot of wealth for the local community, or at least for specific people in the community. It may have worked that it caused trouble, because look at the result of the pigs. Imagine your, the scenario, the man gets healed, end of story. Wow, this is good news. This is amazing. Jesus is amazing. But because of these pigs, it takes a different path. The story changes, it shifts. We read about this in verse 14. Their herdsmen, the pigs' herdsmen, ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what, what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed in his, and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened. 
those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the de- demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. Jesus, we don't really want anything to do whatever all this, with whatever all this is. Can you please leave? This Jewish holy man like has showed up and he sure he healed nutball Bob over here. That's great. That's great. He's clothed and saying, but we have 2,000 pigs or herd that are all dead now. Like, I don't know what's going on here, but can you just leave? And I wonder how, how they would have responded had these pigs not run into the water. So I would submit that my guess is that the demons just like killing and destroying. And they did this to these pigs to stir up trouble with Jesus because it was his arrival into a new land, reaching a new people. Um, so they're fearful and they want Jesus to leave. And it's the sad irony that people here, care, it seems, care more about their property than about their eternal souls. And it's just the reality that oftentimes this is the case. Um, but there's another interesting thing here. They're like, Jesus, please leave. But the man, he has a different request to Jesus. He wants to come with Jesus and Jesus won't let him come. So as we read on verse 18, and he was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he didn't, he did not let him. Jesus wouldn't let him. And he said to him, go home. By the way, just that phrase, go home, had a whole new significance now. He had nowhere to go before, but now he's clothed in his right mind. I just imagine him going home and seeing people and being like, hey, it's me. And they're like, what happened to you? You know, so Jesus says, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. I wonder if that phrase to your people implies also that he's Gentile. Go home to your people. Anyway, and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis, that whole area, that whole region, what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. So this guy is the only guy in this whole region who's encountered Jesus at this point. He is the singular missionary to the whole area of the Decapolis. And it's his job to just go and tell his story. That's his job. Jesus wants this proclaimed, whereas other times when Jesus heals people, in fact, we'll get there in the next chapter, Jesus is going to heal, and he's like, don't tell anyone. But not this guy. This guy, Jesus is like, go tell everybody. Why the difference? Why does he just, sometimes he says, don't tell anyone. Here he says, tell everybody. The difference is, this is Jesus' one visit to this whole region. It's a Gentile audience. They're going to find out about this Jewish Messiah, Jesus guy. But they're not even going to try to set him up as king of Israel. They're not going to try to rebel against the Romans. They're not Jewish. So the message going out isn't going to cause the trouble that it's going to cause when it goes out into the Jewish group when it gets Jesus crucified. So it's, in other words, Jesus is being thoughtful and tactful. God has an agenda and a plan for why things are happening the way they are. Now I want you to imagine um, the impact of these pigs being killed at first caused Jesus to perhaps be asked to leave. So it caused them to be like, get out of here, get out of here. But in the long run, it put a massive spotlight on this guy because what would have been a story you might have heard about became a story you're going to hear about. Because these 2,000 pigs, like this is actually the part of the story that makes it like, you know, become on the news channels back in first century Jerusalem. Uh, there was no, you know that. Um, so anyways, this, this is what, it made it more news than if it was just the man. And in this, I think the demon's plan backfired. It caused initial trouble for Jesus and his mission. But Jesus, no, you know, God's kung fu is good. <laughs> he's, he's like... What you intend for harm, I intend for good. And it causes the news to spread even more. And it, it serves as like a verification of the truthfulness of who Christ was so that when this man's testimony goes out, they know this guy's really changed. And well, we, had, we heard the story. We heard the story before he even came to tell us about it. Um, so the impact of the pigs being killed is it put a spotlight on this guy like never before. And in this, I just remind us that the gates of hell will never prevail. And as we look around and we see the church and we see a failing, we see things going doomy, doomy and gloomy. Um, look up, cheer up. Things have looked worse and God used it for good and he's going to keep doing it. And this is my, my reminder to myself and you that um, the moment you succumb to thinking that the end of the story is bad, you're not having a Christian worldview anymore. And so be encouraged. The gates of hell will not prevail. Okay, verse 18. Verse 18, 
Another insight we get from this passage says, and as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. I read this before, but I want to read it again because this is a neat. Look at what Jesus asks him. Um, He did not let him, but he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Who do you think Jesus is talking about? God? I mean, he's speaking about the Lord and he had mercy on you. Maybe it's God. He could be, I guess he could be referring to himself. He doesn't usually talk about himself in that fashion. You know, he might say the son of man, but he doesn't say the Lord and he like that. We don't usually see that. But then he goes on, verse 20, it says, and he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And here we get the big picture. The big picture of this passage is the identity of Christ. We've been ramping up, right? Um, Right now we see Jesus, he's not only cast out demons, they not only bow down and have to obey what he says, but now he has power over thousands of demons with his command. There's just no limit to his authority, that's the point. There's no boundaries to this thing. We have, like, you know, Michael the Archangel, he has, like, limits to his authority and his ability. Jesus, unlimited. When he decides to exercise this authority, it just goes out. Um, Last week we talked about how he had power over the storm and sea, and that was something that only Yahweh did in the Old Testament. And this week, we see thousands of demons. I mean, do you not get the extremity of Christ's power and authority? And then next week, we're going to talk about Jesus raising the dead. Mark is ramping things up. He wants you to see Christ and these spheres of his authority over the demonic, over the natural world, and even over death. So this is the interesting insight about Christ's identity. He's told Tell him what the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he proclaims what Jesus had done for him. And this is a subtle point. Um, You know, some would say Jesus said, tell him what God did. And he told him what Jesus did. And I would say that fits our theology well. I like that. That's, it's, it's cool. It's cute. It's nice. It's subtle. It's like a, it's just like right there, you know, just sitting in the passage. That's kind of neat. But some would say maybe Jesus meant himself when he said the Lord. But again, I, I just highlight this, but how he had mercy on you. Can you imagine If Jesus, because some people try to say that Jesus thought less of himself than he really did in the Gospel of Mark in particular. This is like a modern liberal theologian thing they like to say. Um, But can you imagine like the Apostle Paul, he heals somebody, he says, hey, go and tell him how Paul had mercy on you. Like it just doesn't, it just doesn't fit. The one who helped him is the one who had mercy on him. And he's like, yeah, that was Jesus. He's the source of my help. He's the source of this mercy. Um, He is the Lord. So the options here are either, A, Jesus is identifying, being identified as God, right? Because he says the Lord and then the guy tells him about Jesus. Or B, Jesus is taking credit for things as though he was God because he's talking about himself as he is the Lord who had mercy on this man. And so either way you get here, this is at least some sort of a hint of the deity, the the sovereignty of Christ Christ. Um, and his nature is deity. Now, when you put that together with the whole Gospel of Mark, and it seems very clear. It seems very clear. It's just consistent throughout. Okay, now we're going to get into the apologetic side of things. Um, here's the debate. Um, in, in Mark, we get this in verse um, 1, and then again in verse, was it 13 or 14? There's another spot. Anyway, there's two places here where the, the term Gerasa is used, or the, the Gerasenes, um, where this place is mentioned. And the problem is that Gera, uh, Gerasa, or Gerasa, this is a, a known city that was about 30 miles away, nowhere near the coast of Galilee, at least not from their perspective. Um, and then that's it. That's all you'll hear. And then, I mean, I've seen videos where people mock the Gospel of Mark, they're like, ha, 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 flying pig jokes come out and like, boy, those pigs were just running and running and running and running and running for 30 miles till they got to the sea and ran in, all that kind of thing. And I'll say, um, oftentimes, here's what happens as you study these supposed contradictions. You hear it and you go, oh, whoa, and it freaks you out. And that's where people stop. They heard the objection. Now they just think, oh, the Bible's got problems. But if you do your homework and you spend some time on it, you will generally find your faith strengthened, actually. Uh, Here's a bunch of information for you, so I hope you're ready for it. Um, There's a lot of textual variance in these passages. In Mark and in Matthew and Luke, the parallel passages that deal with the same event. And this means there's guesswork here. This means that in the ancient manuscripts we have, some say Gerasa, some say Gerasenes, some say Gergesenes. And those are three different places. 
And so the debate is, well, which one of these is original in the first place? And so it makes things a little bit more complicated. But most people agree that in Mark, Gerasa is the original reading. And that's why it's the Gerasenes, the country of the Gerasenes. So that Gerasenes is the original reading. Now I'm going to offer you four possible solutions to this uh, supposed contradiction. Actually, I might have five. I think I have five. Usually I just give you one. I'm going to give you five today and then I'll explain why afterwards. So here's five possible solutions. Some would say um, that Gerasa is the wrong reading and it should be Gergesa. Gergesa is actually a city on the Sea of Galilee in the right location for this to happen. The Lexham Bible Dictionary says about Gergesa, um, it says, locating the miracle in Gergesa aligns well with the geography of the story as it is located on the edge of the sea and has cliffs. Additionally, ancient caves discovered in this location may have functioned as tombs, which aligns with the context of the miracle. So they're suggesting, yeah, Gergesa, it may be just, it's just a, it's just a manuscript issue. Oh, it's really Gergesa, it's not Gerasa. That could be one solution. But it seems unlikely that Gerasa is the wrong reading. It seems like it was Gerasa, not Gergesa. So then we have a bit of a challenge there. Um, but there may be some other ways of getting us to that same location. So here's another possibility. Mark, Matthew, and Luke, none of them say it happened in the city of Gerasa, Gergesa, or Gerasenes, any of that. They all say it happened in the region. They speak of a region, not a city, in every case. And this is something a lot of the skeptics, I think, miss. Um, Gerasa was 30 miles away, yes, and, but it was a well-known city of the Decapolis. And it might be that you could say Mark is just giving them a generic region. You know, they're in the Sea of Galilee up in the north. The Sea of Galilee was not like fishermen went all over. You know, Peter would have spent his whole life in one section of the Sea of Galilee. He would have been up in that area. He never would have gone down to this section. This is the new territory for him. He just wouldn't have gone there. And um, so it may be that while Mark has more details about like the locations of a field over here by, um, you know, by this city or this town on the Sea of Galilee, yet when it comes to the more south or easterly part of the sea, he becomes very regional because that's what Peter would have done, being familiar with one area, less familiar with another area. That's a possibility. So it could be that he's just saying, oh, it's a region. Uh, Mark is giving himself, uh, giving attention to his Roman audience. And he's like, hey, um, y'all know, y'all know Garasa. So it's in, the, it's in that region. It's in the region of the Gerasenes. That's where we landed. So that's a possibility. Um, a third option, third possibility is some people say that Garasa may have been another yet undiscovered city on Galilee. That there's just, yeah, there's a Gerasa 30 miles away and there's another one on the Sea of Galilee. Now, others would say, well, there's no support for that. And the response is, well, yes, there is. We have an ancient first century document that describes a city on the, city, on the Sea of Galilee and calls it the region of the Gerasenes. Yeah, that's the Gospel of Mark. Like, Mark's a historical source too. <laughs> and so some act like the New Testament itself doesn't establish anything. Like it's, like it's spurious, you can't even consider it. Um, however, I'd say we don't have additional support. We don't have extra biblical support to confirm that this was another town. But there were lots of towns with multiple, or multiple towns of the same name. I mean, how many were named Caesarea or Alexandria? There's an awful lot of them, uh, even in close proximity to one another. So that's a possibility. A fourth option comes from uh, Richard Bauckham, uh, the scholar, who, who says that um, in older biblical times, this area where this healing took place, this miracle happened, um, this is, was inhabited by the Geshurites, the Geshurites, these Old Testament folk, okay? They inhabited this particular region. And so it's possible they would still call the area by that name because it didn't talk about a city, it talked about a region, the country of, and it could be the Geshurites. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all refer to the country of. So there may be no city to look for here. There may have been a city in the area, but the city's not named, just the region. The region is named. Now, how does he establish this? How does Richard Bauckham establish this? Well, he says, the, the thing is in the Greek, um, Gerasenes and Geshurites are really close together in Greek. Gerasenes is Gesurenoi, and Geshurites is Gerusenoi. Let me read them to you. Gesurenoi, Gerusenoi. It's just the S and the R that are switched the sigma and the rho. These two letters are just wrote, are switched in these words. He goes on to say, it's a simple reversal of the R and the S consonants. This sort of error is especially common when copying down unfamiliar names. Uh, when copying names, we get most of the errors in manuscripts, a lot of errors, because 
you, you know, you can look at the context and you can tell what was written there even if you had a misspelling. But with a name, like if you misspelled my name and you put like M-Y-K-E on a paper, nobody would have any context to know you spelled it wrong. So a later copier would just keep copying that down. They wouldn't be able to notice the problem. So he, he's saying that that sort of error is especially common in manuscripts with uh, people copying unfamiliar names. So that's Richard Bauckham's theory. And then number five, five op options here. And I'm giving you five, I'm dragging you through five possible options for a very specific purpose. I'll explain in a minute, but here's the last one. There's an alternate way to associate this with Gergesa or that, that location from the first option, that, that spot right there by the Sea of Galilee where we actually have the right geography. There's actually cliffs because around the sea, you don't have cliffs. It's a lot of flat land, but over here you do, just right here. And it's the location that seems to be described in that passage. Um, the idea is that Gerasa and Gergesa are acceptable alternate ways of describing the same city and the same area. Gerasa and Gergesa, that it's just flexible. Uh, Mexico, Mexico. It's, they're both talking about the same place. That's the idea. And here's the, here's the description. Okay. If I haven't lost you yet, I feel like some people are like, you're losing me now, Mike. It's too much, too many information. Gargasa, Ceresa, I don't know anymore. Cesare Philippi, I'm losing it. Um, but stick with me. Okay. Gargasa, the city and the area of Gargasa is modern day Kursi. Like it's, up until recently, it was a town in living memory, up until very recently. Kursi is the name of the, t of the town. In Aramaic, which would have been the mother language for Peter and for Mark, their original language, Aramaic. You would write this town name, Gergesa or Kursi, with just three letters, GRS or KRS. That's how you would write it out in Aramaic. Three letters, you don't put the vowels in. The vowels are just known. It's just the, their language is like that. Um, okay, so three letters. This means that, at least according to some scholars, that this is a suitable option for, for, for taking Kursi and having it as Gerasa. It has the same letters. And since the vowels were thrown in later, this actually works. It's a suitable option for translating from Aramaic to Greek. So if you go to the mother language Aramaic, you find that these two names are both options, Gergesa and Gerasa. Um, that, I, I don't know, I kind of like that option. I think it makes sense of the fact that Mark has, uh, you know, uh, Gerasa and then later manuscripts have Gergesa because maybe they're trying to figure this, these same questions out. Now, why would I present you with a variety of options and not tell you which one it has to be? Well, for one, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which one it's going to be. I'm not sure. But also, ancient history can be this way. We are putting together missing pieces. It's not like we know everything there is to know about the Bible or about the New Testament times or about the Sea of Galilee. There's all kinds of stuff we don't know. So what you do is you gather the data you have and you ask, how do these things fit together, at least potentially? So a survey of possible options is sometimes the most respectable thing you can do. Um, and how should I then respond if I see a supposed contradiction and I don't know what the answer is, but I know there's like five possible answers. Should this bother me? I think I'm encouraged by this. I think maybe I don't know the answer, but knowing that there are five potential answers that all are avenues worth looking into, I think you can perhaps pick one and tentatively hold on to it. And it's good doing apologetics to know that just because you have an answer to a question doesn't mean it's the only possible answer. And even when your answer might be, maybe you find out your answer was wrong. That doesn't mean there's no answer. Maybe you should have just kept researching. So I like surveying various ways of answering any objection for that very reason. I should respond positively to this stuff. So the conclusion of the passage, after all that, and we'll go to your guys' uh, discussion and stuff, is um, Jesus, his identity, he is the son of God. Right? He can command thousands of demons. There is no limit to his authority and power. There simply isn't a limit. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. And the application for you is, if he can restore this ruined man who is totally epically ruined, your hope is in Christ. Your hope is still in Christ. Nobody would have thought, take this guy to Jesus. They would have thought it was a waste of time. But now we know, no, 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 no. This is, Jesus is what he needs. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, your holy word, um, for this passage of scripture. Uh, don't even pretend or feel like I've exhausted the goodness of it in any way. But we do see your love for people, your compassion for this crazy guy who was probably despised 
by others, and yet you, you love him so much. And that speaks of your love for us, even in our lowest state, even in our worst, most backwards, when we've been caught up in our sins, in our rebellion, and when we're suffering the worst pains of our own bad decisions, Lord, you're there. You're there to rescue. And we're just grateful, God. Thank you for your mercy and your love that endures forever. Thank you for your kindness that is so constant and that is so comforting to us. Lord, we come to you uh, weak and broken and you heal us and you strengthen and we're, we're grateful, God. Uh, we pray for the leading of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray for continued wisdom as we even fellowship, even tonight. We just pray that we would be growing in Christ and building each other up in you. In Jesus' name, amen.